you really look at history uh, in this country over a long period, there's always been a certain amount of turmoil. This evening's program is to talk about the great leadership that was shown by two of, of the um, people, a military leader, a Republican Secretary of Republican Secretary of War who served under a Democratic president. And uh, the, the great thing about that, it was about what's good for America, not what's, not, not, not what's good for a party or for a constituency. It's what's good for what is, is America. And I think that's uh, the message that I'd like to uh, carry forward. Uh, <clears throat> Ted Aldridge was, was uh, born and uh, raised in uh, uh, Roentown, Connecticut, attended Colgate, majored in economics, political science, earned an MBA at uh, Boston College. <clears throat> He's had a distinguished career in banking, specializing principally in financing of commodities. And uh, I, I, I recall in our conversations, he's had some contacts with our home-based Cargill folks also. So uh, that's uh, not new. Beginning with UBS in New York, Zurich in London, uh, he's held senior positions with Deutsche Bank, Fortis, and Mizuho, which is a, a Japanese bank, <clears throat> before taking a position with Aramat International, uh, a, a former client of, uh, of, of the world's largest uh, precious metals merchants in the world. Uh, Ted, uh, Ted apologized, said, I'm not a historian. Well, I'm not either. I used Harold Deutsch as my excuse, but uh, uh, that's uh, uh, s some of the finest speakers over our 36 years have been journalists, and um, um, uh, curious um, intellectuals, I mean, maybe I'll call it that. <clears throat> but uh, Ted's uh, love of history began eight years old after 30 years of reading and uh, commuting by train from Connecticut to Manhattan. Uh, he, he wrote this book over eight years on the subway or the train. And uh, I, uh, it, it's, it's a book that uh, I hope will get more attention. And I, I've got some ideas, Ted, as I have thought more uh, since our dinner last night. Um, he lives with his wife, Susie, three children in Westport, Connecticut. Ted, welcome to Minnesota. I, I'm sorry we couldn't have a blizzard for you. Welcome, thank you. Thank you, Don, and thanks everyone for coming. Uh, I suppose it's good we don't have a blizzard. You probably wouldn't be here. Uh, I am uh, thrilled to be here. This is uh, uh, because I still have a job. I've, done, I've had about 30 talks, but all in the New York area, and this is the first one outside New York. So I'm thrilled to be here, if not a little intimidated. Most of my talks are in front of librarians or, or li libraries or bookstores or um, senior men's groups, but to be at a World War II round table, I, I just, I feel like it's like I have more than 100 fact checkers here, so I can't really BS tonight. Um, I'm gonna start this presentation by telling you a story which will lead into the first part of it, which is why I wrote the book um, in um, late November 1943. Franklin Roosevelt had a huge decision to make. He had to decide who was going to command the air, sea, and land forces um, for Project Overlord, the invasion of France. Uh, he had been uh, struggling with this decision for about six months uh, since they decided in Washington six months earlier to, uh, to go ahead with, with D-Day. Um, he uh, had two choices, two logical choices. One was the man on the left, George Marshall. Now, he had been in charge of the Army and the Air Force for four years at that point. He was one of the most respected, no, he was the most respected military person in the country. Uh, he had an impeccable service record. The British respected him. Stalin respected him. Congress respected him. Uh, the Navy respected him. So he was a logical choice. But he also had another job. 
so it didn't make it that easy to, to choose him. Um, the other choice uh, was, of course, this man on the right, Dwight Eisenhower. Now, when, when Marshall started, uh, took over the Army and Air Force uh, four years earlier, um, in 39, um, Eisenhower uh, was um, a lieutenant general, uh, sorry, lieutenant colonel in the Philippines working for Douglas MacArthur there on the left. Uh, and by the way, this, this decision was made for those who want a refresher on the timeline. When Roosevelt's making this decision, it had been two years after Pearl Harbor and two years before the war ended. Um, so Eisenhower was someone who um, Marshall plucked out of his unhappy position in the Philippines. He didn't really care for General MacArthur. And he promoted him several times. And he um, was in, responsible for the invasion of North Africa and for Italy. Uh, so he was. Uh, a, another choice, and obviously a pretty good one. Um, so Roosevelt was struggling with his decision. He had a number of people in high places telling them that he should not hire Marshall. The reason was Marshall was too important in Washington. Among those were Admiral King, head of the Navy, uh, General Pershing, the former World War I hero, uh, Hap Arnold, head of the Air Force, working for Marshall. They all said he's too important in Washington. Um, you, you can't send him. But Roosevelt, seen here with Eisenhower uh, around the time this decision was made, he, he just wanted to reward Marshall for all the amazing work he had done. Um, so it appears he was going to do that because he was on his way to the Tehran Conference to meet Stalin and Churchill. And he stopped in Algeria on the way uh, to basically tell, Marshall, tell Eisenhower that he wasn't going to be the man. Uh, and when he got Eisenhower alone, he, he broke the news to him like this. He said, Ike, you and I uh, both know who the chief of staff was during the American Civil War, but nobody else does. And uh, I don't want, in 50 years, I do not want George Marshall to be simply a footnote in military history. Um, I don't know what Eisenhower's reaction was. I don't know if he anticipated getting the assignment, but he probably shrugged his shoulders. Uh, and, and that was it. He assumed that Marshall was going to be given the command. Um, Roosevelt then flew to Tehran, but it seemed he had a change of, uh, change of heart. And he asked his aide, Harry Hopkins, on the right, um, he said, I want you to go see General Marshall and you know, flush him out about where he, what he thinks about this command. And Hopkins said to Roosevelt, you know, you know what he's going to say, the same thing he's always said. Because Marshall never once hinted he wanted it, or hinted he even, you know, cared to have any command. Um, because he was a man of the highest integrity. Uh, but Roosevelt sent him anyways. Hopkins went to the general and said, General, Roosevelt has asked me to, to ask you what you think about who should command E-Day. And, and Marshall responded, listen, Roosevelt is the commander in chief. I can't bias him to tell him about what I feel. He needs to make that decision himself. So Hopkins went back to Roosevelt, and Roosevelt said, what did he say? And, and Hopkins said the same thing he always says. Um, you know, he, he's not going to tell you. He's not going to give you his advice. He thinks that's your call. Roosevelt slept on it, and um, he still wanted more and more crack. So he asked General Marshall to come see him at his villa. And this is in Tehran. And this, these are these two gentlemen at the Tehran conference. And Marshall came into his office, into his suite, and said, uh, uh, Roosevelt said, General, um, I, I want your thoughts on who I should give command to, to D-Day. And you know, Marshall said the same thing. He said, listen, uh, Mr. President, you know the strengths and weaknesses of us all. Uh, you've been dealing with this. You know the importance of people in the positions. And you've made great calls. And, and this is your call to make. And I don't want to bias you. Um, Roosevelt thought about it for a second and said, well, General, I, I just couldn't sleep if you weren't in Washington. And the next day, he named Eisenhower as the commander of D-Day. And of course, Eisenhower went on to fame, went on to the presidency. And George Marshall, if it weren't for the Marshall Plan, would just be a military footnote, along with Harvey Halleck and Peyton March, who were the respective sec uh, chiefs of staff during the Civil War and, the, and, and World War I. So I read this years ago, and it got me really interested in, in George Marshall. And it leads uh, me to um, this part of the presentation, which is why I wrote this book. Um, and then I'm going to talk about what was so special about their relationship. So why I wrote the book, um, as Don mentioned, I'm a banker. History has just been a, uh, a hobby of mine. 
Um, and I don't really take a methodical approach to reading it. I'm more kind of like a drunken time traveler as I move from era to era. Uh, but like a lot of you, I find the World War II really compelling. Um, so I, I fall upon it many times. And I've read books about all the guys who are surrounding Marshall and Stimson there, uh, most of whom you know. I won't go over their names. Um, but those are the ones that, that, that the publishers want to publish, people on the front lines, people who are leading countries, people who are uh, on the white horse, so to speak. Um, no one really wants to read about someone sitting behind a desk in Washington. But in all of these books, the name Marshall and Stimson kept on coming up. Uh, obviously in other people's stories, but in always kind of impressive ways. And as a reader of history, I'm just making mental notes like, God, I should read more about these two. So I read a book on Marshall, totally impressed. Uh, much like people were impressed when they read the book on Alexander, Handel Hamilton, uh, Alexander Hamilton by Chernow. I was just impressed what, what, ac what major accomplishments he, he had during the war, yet he was known for the Marshall Plan. Um, so I didn't think there was any book there. Uh, I, I didn't think, I never thought I'd ever write a book. That wasn't, you know, I just, I went back to my time traveling and I landed uh, at some point in the Cold War. Um, the Cold War lasted obviously from the end of the war till 91, uh, but I was focused on people in the 50s. Uh, John McCloy and Robert Lovett in the upper left who were, uh, worked on the staff of Stimson. Um, Forrestal, Under Secretary of Navy, Harriman, lower left Atchison, Dwight Eisenhower, of course, uh, Harvey Bundy, and, and George Bush, who was president when the war ended. And in each of these cases, Stimson was either a protege, uh, sorry, either these men were protégés of Stimson, or they were all Stimsonians, people that followed his particular policies. Um, and, uh, and, and Eisenhower was asked late in his life by his biographer, Stephen Ambrose, um, Stephen Ambrose asked him, you know, who's the greatest American you ever met? And he didn't hesitate. He said, George Marshall, followed closely by Henry Stimson. And when I read that, I'm thinking, who, who are these guys? <laughs> that someone like Eisenhower, who met a lot of great people in his lifetime, immediately said, these are the two greatest Americans he ever met. So I, um, I thought to myself, I knew enough about history to know, all right, chief of staff, and Secretary of War, they had to work pretty closely together. So I decided to, to find a book on those two. And I found nothing. One person wrote a one-page article at some point years ago. So I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll be able to do this. But I did a little research. I read a four-volume, five-volume biography of Marshall. I got a little, but not much. And then I read, I listened to 40 hours of interviews that uh, Forrest Pogue, his biographer, gave to Marshall in the 50s. Again, I got snippets of something which a book could be made of. Um, and then I went to Yale University, where I found the Stimson Diaries, 10,000 pages, um, 4,000 of which he kept during the war. And I was there an hour, and I knew I had something. Because every day he wrote four or five pages in his diary, I actually did it on a dictaphone, I had someone transcribe it, explaining who he met that day, what they talked about, and what his feelings were, and, and how he thinks things went, were going. Um, once I got that from microfilm onto a digital thumb drive, put it on my laptop, I was good to go. Um, it wasn't a subway, it was a train that I researched and wrote the book. Subway would have been really hard, you know, strap hangers. Uh, as it was, the train was fine as long as I didn't have a middle seat. Metro North trains have that middle seat and you can't move at all, so always had to get there a little early. Um, and infrastructure's just really bad in the Northeast now, so the train, which when I started commuting was an hour from Westport to New York, is now like an hour and 18 minutes, so I had extra time to write this book. Um, one of the things that right away that I was intrigued by and I thought was a, a really interesting was the the, the contrast between their careers. This is Stimson's career. He was born in New York, fairly wealthy family. His father was a pretty well-known doctor. Um, he went to Phillips of Andover, which was a pretty elite school in Massachusetts, the most elite private school. Went to Yale, where he was number three in his class. Harvard Law, number two in his class. Then he went to work for a guy who became Secretary of War and Secretary of State named Elihu Root. Uh, and um, when Root left to go into public service, Stimson took over the firm, became uh, Winthrop Stimson, which lasted 100 years, is one of the 
top law firms in New York. Um, and then he was hired by his friend Teddy Roosevelt, and I'm gonna repeat that for effect. Teddy Roosevelt was his friend, shows you how long his career was. Uh, hired him to be U.S. Attorney General of the Southern District of New York uh, during a time when trust busting was the thing. And uh, he did an excellent job in that and caught the bug. Uh, and he spent the rest of his life as what was later de uh, defined as a wise man. People moving back and forth between on the Northeast Corridor between law firms or, or, or banks and public service. Uh, the wise man was um, really attached to people in the post-war. Uh, a lot of people who worked for Stimson who who were advisors to presidents uh, from the war right through the Ronald Reagan era. Um, he then, he went back and forth. He was uh, Secretary of War in 1911 uh, when America was still fighting Native Americans, if you can believe that. And this next time he was Secretary of War, he was ushering in the nuclear era. Um, he fought in World War I when he was 50. I'll tell you that story in a little while. Governor General of the Philippines, Secretary of State under Hoover. Um, he caught Roosevelt's attention and a lot of people's because um, in between from 1933 until he was named in 1940, he spent seven years going around giving radio addresses and speeches to anyone who would listen, much like Churchill was doing in London. He did it in America saying, you need to pay attention to this guy Hitler. He's bad news. We need to do something about it. Uh, when Paris fell, Roosevelt called him, even though he's a Republican who spent years trashing the New Deal. Uh, he called Stimson. He wanted a strong interventionist, respected interventionist in the cabinet, so he put him there. Um, now, Marshall's career is a little different. Uniontown, Pennsylvania, went to Virginia Military Institute, uh, joined the Army, and I'm not going to go over these and don't be intimidated by all these little stops. They're mainly state flags um, of the places. If you're in the Army in peacetime, you're just moving from fort to fort every two years. Uh, one of them's Minnesota, you can tell. And by the way, that's the flag that was the state flag of Minnesota when Marshall was at uh, Fort Snelling. Snelling. Um, so if those, because that's not the current state flag, but it was in 1913 when he was at Fort Snelling. Um, he, uh, he quickly became, right when he joined the Army, one of the top students, always number one in his class at the various war colleges. Then he became the top teacher in the Army because he was just very gifted at teaching. Uh, then he became a top staff officer. Now, if those of you, and you probably there are veterans among you and, and those who know enough about history to know that if you are considered a great staff officer, that is not a good thing to be because you're not going to get promoted. Um, and Marshall struggled with that. He had, it was this interesting dichotomy between this incredible performance where his service record was, was unparalleled and a lack of promotions because all the big shots wanted him to be on his staff or wanted him to teach at the war colleges. Um, he got his break, but Marshall would forever deny that it was a break during World War I. I'm gonna quickly tell the story and apologies to those who heard this at the student section. Um, he was working in the first division uh, and uh, General Pershing was, uh, was reviewing exercises at the first division in France and uh, they put forward these exercises and, um, and then Pershing went to address the general in charge along with six or seven staff members. They got in a round in a semicircle and Pershing just lit into the general in charge saying he was a disgrace and that his men were a disgrace and the outfit was a disgrace to the army and the army was never gonna win the war with bums like them working and he went, he just went off um, and everyone was quiet and silent except Marshall. Marshall said at one point, General, you're, you're, you're General Pershing, you're being unfair. And Pershing glared at him and grunted and, and, and started to walk away. And Marshall, and this is a very young Marshall, this is that guy in the middle picture there, grabbed Pershing's arm. This is Black Jack Pershing. And uh, said, General, you need to listen to me. I've been here longest and I can explain things to you that you, you need to hear. And for the next five minutes, he explained all the problems that the First Division was having, all the, the shortages they were having, how they were addressing each problem every night and solving it by the morning, and how he should be praising the First Division, not criticizing them. Um, Pershing listened, but he was still a little upset with the general. He, he stormed off. 
And, and everyone turned to Marshall, meaning the general and the other six guys, and just said, what were you thinking? You know, your, your career's over. Um, but Pershing, as he's walking away with his aide, said, uh, any time in the future we're in contact with the first division, I want it to be through that kid. <laughs> so he very quickly took Marshall into his own staff and kept him there during the war. So after the war, he wasn't promoted. MacArthur, who was a hero in World War I, joined the army a year after Marshall, but got promoted to general 16 years before him. That's the curse of being very good at your job. Um, he um, went on uh, to, to peacetime services. Uh, he got pretty well known by the Roosevelt administration during the Depression. Roosevelt put the Army in charge of all the big public works programs, the CCC. The Army was the perfect vehicle because that's what they do. They take men together and lead them into, uh, you know, to fight a common cause. Um, Harry Hopkins, the man I showed you before, uh, took notice because Marshall naturally was the best at, at, at doing this particular job. Um, and when it came time for a new chief of staff, he whispered in Roosevelt's ear, you should really look at this guy, Marshall. Um, so that's their backgrounds. Um, so what was so special about the partnership? This is a quote from Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill, by the way, thought Marshall was the greatest figure produced by the war. He called him the organizer of victory in public. Um, Stalin uh, said if it weren't for the machines that America produced, which Stimson and Marshall were in charge of producing, that they would never win the war. But this is what Churchill he said. He said, five years after the war, it remains a mystery to me as yet unexplained how the very small staffs which the U.S. kept during the years of peace were able not only to build up the armies and air force units, but also to find the leaders and vast staffs capable of handling enormous masses and of moving them faster and farther than masses have ever been moved in war before. I use this as a quote of the first chapter because this is really, he's describing what Stimson and Marshall were responsible for. Um, Don mentioned that uh, my background, which is financing commodity trading companies, um, one of the biggest agricultural ones, of course, is, is Cargill, so I spent many, many winters. I don't know why I always been visited Minnesota in the middle of winter, but uh, they must that must have been the schedule they had for our bank. Um, pardon? Lucky. Yeah, lucky. Um, but throughout my career, every time I'm talking to the heads of these, these trading companies, the, the problems, when I, I typically asked a question, you know, what keeps you up at night? And it was always logistics, you know, because they were they were basically purchasing raw materials, whether it was agriculture or metals or energy, from the place of origin. And then they had to figure out how to get it to a port and store it at the port, waiting for ships, and then ship it to where they want it to go, and then store it once they got it there, and then distribute it to the various places they needed. And, and these were huge, huge problems that, that each and every one of these trading companies would tell me about. 90% of the time, I'm speaking to them about their problems. Um, I was saying before that if Marshall and Stimson were around uh, and, and listened to one of these guys from Cargill explain their problems, they're like, they'd say, are you kidding me? You call that a problem? Because what they were doing was far greater than that. And I'll explain. Um, so what was the situation in July 40? Um, this is July 40 when Stimson joined Marshall at the at the offices. By the way, they always had adjoining offices where the door was always kept open, um, which was really interesting. It was uh, partly for the fact that they spoke four or five times a day, but also they were sending a message to their staffs, uh, basically saying there are no secrets between the civilians and the military. And uh, their staffs were excellent. I'll talk about them soon. And after the war, they often said they were confused as to who their boss was. That's how much of a unit Stimson and Marshall were. Um, in July 40, soldiers, we had 170,000 when the war started. Uh, the Germans had, including their Air Force, five and a half million. Um, officers, during peacetime, seniority dominates uh, promotions, so you don't always get the highest quality there. Um, barracks, we had none. Weapons, we were using a rifle that predated World War I, the Springfield. Um, ammunition, planes, we only had three, according to Hap Arnold, we only had 300 battle-worthy planes when World War II started, 300. The Germans had 3,000. Um, tanks, you mentioned, it was mentioned in the presentation a while ago, we had very few tanks. 
the war exercises in Louisiana in early 1941 where Eisenhower and Patton kind of earned their bones. Um, we didn't have tanks, so they took pickup trucks and just wrote tank on the side of it in white paint. Um, the Germans had 2,500. Um, right down the line, we were short of everything, which is very typical. Americans were always unprepared for war because we believed we really didn't need to prepare ourselves. Um, we believed that, uh, that we could just, you know, once a war started, just take the rifle off the hearth, hearth and, and go, to, go to war. Um, the War Department was a mess, and we had very dated strategic plans. So this is all when Simpson and Marshall got together. Um, what were the obstacles? Time was one of them. Um, when Stimson joined, Paris had fallen, Norway, uh, Holland, uh, Belgium. Um, they didn't know when war was, we were going to be involved in the war, um, but they knew they were unprepared and they had to prepare themselves. Um, the other is isolationism. Now, I like to show this map when I'm describing isolationism. When I'm reading history, I always wonder to myself sometimes on the big issues whether I would have been on the right side of history. During the Revolution, would I have been a patriot or a loyalist? During the Civil War, would I have been a, if I were living in the North, would I have been a unionist or a copperhead, someone who just said, let them secede? Um, I can say, though, if I were living in that era, I'm pretty sure I would have been an isolationist. Typical American, this is what they saw. They saw a big ocean on the right, 2,500 miles or more. 3,000 miles to, to Europe. Big one on the left, 5,500 5 miles to, uh, to Japan. They saw Canada, which was, as, I'm sure, as friendly then as they are now. Uh, and Mexico was never really a threat. Uh, we'd fought World War I only 23 years before. Uh, a lot of people thought that was a waste of uh, uh, a lot of deaths we had and a waste of treasure. Europe had been fighting for 1,000 years against each other. Why do we need to bail them out again? That's what people thought. Um, and that's what these men were facing and trying to prepare the army once uh, they joined together. Uh, and it was 85% of the country felt this way. And the more in the middle of the country you were, the more you thought that way. The people on the coast, because they were much more involved in the trading overseas, knew that there were certain linkages in, around the world, and Stimson more than most. Um, so the other obstacles during this period before Pearl Harbor, um, we had a, America had a typical fear of, of a, a standing army going back to King George III. I think George Washington was the only one at the Continental Congress who really believed we should have a standing army and everyone shot him down. Um, America's fear of corporate monopolies. I was mentioned uh, an hour ago that um, Hitler had no problem when he was ordering planes or weapons or trucks to go to either Messerschmitt or Krupp or Volkswagen, give them huge contracts. When Marshall and Stimson were trying to, uh, to reward contracts to, uh, for aluminum, Alcoa came in with a bid that was the, for the highest quality, lowest price, quickest delivery. But the new dealers in the Roosevelt administration said, y y you can't do that. You've got to split that contract up. We don't want to create a monopoly here. And Stimson and Marshall were like, listen, we, <laughs> we have a war we're trying to prepare for. So these were big obstacles they faced. The other was general complacency. Marshall used to go around giving speeches, explaining to people that during the Revolution, American Revolution, we won, of course, but we, ha we had 10 times as many soldiers as the British had when you include the militia. War of 1812, he said, we won that, but we had 30 times as many soldiers as the British. Uh, and World War I, he said, you, you know, we all think we were so proud of ourselves about bailing out Europe in World War I. They'd been fighting nearly four years before we got involved in that war. So it was kind of like Germany was pretty beat up by the time we arrived. So we were complacent, uh, Americans were, about what we could do. Um, and it was understandable. Um, so this is where they were. Uh, and, and this is the two of them um, shown standing between the door that was always open. Uh, I was going to use this at the cover photo, but um, my publisher chose another one. Um, and they went to work. Um, tackling each shortage at the same time. When I'm reading Simpson's diary, that was the remarkable thing. He, it was always, he had like 25 different things going on every day. Um, soldiers, I mentioned they had 170,000. Within two years, they had five and a half million. Think of the management exercise, just that alone is. And I have a friend here who's into, uh, as a profession, he's a, a 
studies management, so you're going to appreciate this. Um, barracks, they had none. Within 18 months, they built enough barracks for 1.2 million people in 250 locations. I came from a small town in uh, Connecticut called Rowayton that has a population of 5,000. I calculated that's 250 Rowaytons they built in 18 months. Again, the management challenge behind that, remarkable. Ammunition, they had to create and, and, and contract for everything from the standard issue army boot to the, B, the big high-tech airplanes. Um, I'm gonna talk, I'll talk about one of them. This is, um, I mentioned that they had rifles, the Springfield rifles that predated World War I. They had to come up with a new rifle. Now, it's not like they can just go to Amazon Prime, <laughs> type in high-powered rifle, sort through the ratings, and then type in, I need, uh, yeah, three million. Um, <laughs> what goes into a rifle is incredible. And when I studied it, and this is why I put this, I, I wouldn't have thought about this, but you need consistency. Um, you need durability, it has to last the war. Precision, every soldier wants the thing to be precise. Weight, 99% of us, the time a soldier has a rifle, he's carrying it, he's not shooting it. it has to be light. Cost is obvious, ease to manufacture rate of fire, ease of use, all these things, they had to, they were in charge of, 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 of dealing with that. Now Marshall's men, of course, wanted the perfect weapon. You always want to protect your soldiers. Stimson's men said, listen, we can give you the perfect weapon, but it's going to take 10 years, probably a few billion dollars. So they had to work together to come up with a perfect weapon. And General Patton said the Grand Rifle was the greatest battle implement ever devised in history. You know, that's a pretty uh, hyperbolic statement, but obviously it was a very good, uh, a good working um, relationship that the two staffs had to put together and balance all these things together. So they had to do that for everything. Planes and tanks, supplies, trucks, shipping, strategic plans. Now, obviously they didn't have to build carriers. The Navy did have certain responsibilities there, but the Air Force was not independent during World War II as part of the Army. So they had to really create everything else. And it was an enormous task. Um, and and uh, they couldn't do it alone. So I'm going to spend a little time talking about their staffs. Now, this is one of my favorite slides, because I always picture giving this presentation in, in front of an elementary school and asking the kids, um, do you notice any pattern here? Um, Stimson was an elitist. but. Let me explain why it's not exactly what you think. As you can see, his five core staff all went to Harvard Law School, and three of the five went to, to Yale. So one would think he's just you know, dealing with the old school network uh, uh, and hiring people that only went to those schools. Um, but it's more than that. The, the five men he hired, and they were considered the best staff in Washington during the war. I consider them the best staff of any cabinet officer in history. Um, they had a remarkable record starting in school. Patterson in the upper left was number two in his class at Harvard Law. Harvey Bundy, the lower right, was number one in his class at Harvard Law. Harrison, I don't, couldn't find his school ranking, but he clerked for Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., so I'm guessing it was pretty high. Um, but it was their careers that were remarkable. Patterson was one of the great New York lawyers and then became a great judge in New York. Um, he was under Secretary of War. Um, uh, McCloy was considered one of the greatest negotiators of his time, uh, and he was a top New York lawyer. Um, Lovett was one of the great businessmen. He was the founder of Brown Brothers Harriman. Um, he later on had a great career as Secretary of War and Secretary of State. Um, Harrison was the head of the New York Fed and also in charge, president of one of the top insurance companies, and Bundy was the top lawyer in New England. Marshall, slightly different uh, strategy. Um, you might not be able to see, you're probably too far away, but that black thing he's holding, it says, My Little Black Book. Um, he wasn't sitting with it for the portrait. I was just showing off my um, tech skills and, and uh, <laughs> photoshopped it in, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll tell you why I did. Um, Marshall was a remarkable man. A third of my book is devoted to his background um, before I talk about the, the buildup in the war. Um, when you know most soldiers during peacetime, and, and I, I don't mean this to be disrespectful of soldiers, but it seems most soldiers during peacetime back in those days, you're on remote forts that were built to defend ourselves against Native Americans. There was nothing to do. They hunted, they played sports, they drank, 
they chase women. Marshall's one of those guys we probably would have all disliked because he was studying, studying battle plans. Uh, he was the perfect soldier. Um, and he, um, one of the things he did was he carried around a black book with him his entire career. And any time he came across someone impressive, he jotted their name down into it. What was impressive about the man and how he might be of use in the future if there was a war? I mean, who does this, right? And in Eisenhower, he met Eisenhower in 1919. Eisenhower was given overlapping responsibilities for working on Pershing's memoirs, World War I memoirs. Marshall was in charge of them. And Eisenhower comes into Marshall's office, and again, this is 1919, um, and says, uh, I, I have, uh, I don't know what his rank was, Marshall at that time, but let's say it was Colonel. Colonel, I have, uh, I have some ideas about how I think the Mar Pershing's memoir should be restructured. And, and um, Marshall politely said, um, I, I think I have it covered, we're gonna do it my way. Now most officers would have just, you know, saluted and walked out and said, yes sir. But Eisenhower said, well, hold on a second, hear me out on this, because I think I have some good ideas. And Marshall listened to him, and um, when he left, Marshall took out his black book, and, Dwight Eisenhower, <laughs> affable, really smart, isn't a yes man, candid, you know, he could be of use in the future. Um, now Patton, on the right there, upper right, slightly different notation into the black book. Uh, I'm gonna paraphrase what he wrote, but something to the effect of complete maniac, but he did, he actually wrote, if you can keep him on a, sh you should keep him on a short leash, but he would be a great tank commander. And he met, and this was years before Patton became Patton. Um, so all these guys around here were, were guys that Marshall had put down in his black book. Um, and when it came time, Marshall always believed his duty was to assume that war was gonna start in a month. That was his duty. So when war, find, and, and by the way, two things had to happen. One, he had to, war, war had to happen, and that wasn't a given. And the other was he had to be in a position of authority. Otherwise, this diary would have been a waste of time for him. Turns out, here he was, chief of staff, the war's about to start. So he just went to his book and just almost perfectly, in almost all cases, matched the right guy at the right time in the right position. Um, so all the hard work paid off. Um, so, they had their staffs, they were preparing, and of course, they didn't know when the war was gonna start, and this happened, Pearl Harbor. A quick story about the reactions, different reactions of the two men. Again, it was such a pleasure reading Stimson's diary, and when I read his diary on December 7th, 1941, he was almost excited, certainly hugely optimistic. He was so relieved, he said, this is great, uh, we are going to now, a united country, we are gonna crush these guys. I can't wait to get to work. Marshall, on the other hand, was devastated. His wife wrote in his memoirs that he came home that night, and instead, as a Southern gentleman, he always kissed his wife hello and greeted. He just went straight for the staircase, didn't even look at her, and said, I'm going to sleep. Uh, and I thought to myself, and I don't have many original thoughts in this book, but I have a few, and I'm like, why? Why is that such a different reaction? Here they are both working together. But I figured it out. It's because Stimson had spent his career advising the CEOs of top corporations in America. He also advised top corporations in Europe. He also, as Secretary of State, went on these economic conferences where he could see and hear the countries talk about their relative GDPs uh, and, 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 and capabilities. So he knew when, when the, the day Pearl Harbor happened, he knew that in no time, America was gonna be outproducing all the other countries on both sides of the conflict combined which is what happened. Uh, and he knew this, that's why he was so optimistic. Whereas Marshall, smart guy, but he didn't have any of that knowledge. He was just, he knew we were unprepared and we were going to war. Um, so that was an interesting anecdote. So they had to continue to prepare America, but then they had all these other issues to deal with because they had to fight a war on four different continents. Here are some of the issues they faced. Um, Don mentioned earlier, Machines were coming off the plants, but they weren't going to the American army. They had to, uh, they were continuing to go to the United Kingdom, uh, the Soviet Union, and China. Those decisions had to be made by Stimson and Marshall. 
then strategic decisions. All right, we're at war now with Germany and Japan. Who, who, who do we fight first? Where do we put our main resources? Of course, they, the original decision was let's take care of Germany first, first and then Japan later. Slightly changed after Midway. Um, and then the European strategy. Simpson and Marshall wanted to go into France as soon as possible, probably sooner than was prudent. Uh, the British never wanted to go. Even the day before D-Day, Churchill was still against it. They thought maybe because of their World War I experience, it was just going to be a complete slaughter. The British thought that we could beat the Germans without ever going into France or Germany just by bombing them or blockading them. He ended up, Churchill ended up, great man, he ended up being wrong in this case because, as you know, Churchill never surrendered. He finally killed himself when the Soviets and the Americans were knocking on the bunker. So Marshall was right that the only way you can win a war is to get boots on the ground. Um, there were strat strategic issues in the Pacific. Um, the Philippines, which was a territory that belonged to us, they had to decide what to do there. That was a huge decision because they had 15,000 men there. And do you sac take them away or do you sacrifice them? And the first time Marshall thought Roosevelt was a great man when he agreed with Marshall and Stimson that you had to sacrifice them because it's important to show the world that we defend our interests. Um, Japanese Americans, it's a whole chapter in my book about that was a bad call, that, uh, understandable, but a bad call they made. The Japanese Americans were really no threat, um, but there was such panic after Pearl Harbor that um, there was a lot of pressure to, to remove them away from the West Coast where a lot of the manufacturing plants were. The atomic bomb, Stimson was put in charge of that. Again, I, I'm, I'm in awe of their, the management skills that were required by these two men. The atomic bomb had 130,000 different employees. That alone, and, and Stimson was in charge of it, and Marshall, Marshall reported to Stimson. That alone, on top of everything else, was something they had to manage. They had to manage the secrecy behind it as well. Um, you know, the, famously, Vice when, when, when Roosevelt died, and most of you probably know this, but when Roosevelt died, Stimson went to the White House, and um, Truman was sworn in, and in the cabinet room, and. Uh, when they're all walking out, <laughs> Stimson tapped uh, Truman on the shoulder, said, I need to speak to you, Mr. President, about something. And he explained that there, we were building this weapon in New Mexico. Truman, who was Vice President of the United States, had no idea this thing was being built. That's how secret it was. Um, they had to start talking about the post-war. Stimson was so confident of victory, he started talking about that in the first six months, preparing for the post-war, even though we were, the Japanese were winning all the battles Germany was winning all the battles. Stimson's talking about what we're gonna do after we win this war. Um, he was remarkable in that degree. How to end the war in Japan, occupation of conquered towns. They had all these issues. They had to face obstacles, internal obstacles as well. Roosevelt's management practices, um, Stalin, uh, De Gaulle, um, going around counterclockwise, um, the press. Again, a big theme in the book is fighting a war in a democracy is not easy. You have to deal with the press. Um, that's Donald Nelson there who represents uh, one of many groups of people, smart people put together in committees to help Stimson and Marshall uh, procure weapons. Often they were a hindrance uh, because Marshall just put too many people, too many cooks uh, inside the kitchen. MacArthur, of course, uh, was... Um, Marshall had every reason not to bring retire MacArthur out of retirement. MacArthur was a hindrance on his career, prevented him from getting promotions. Uh, when he was chief of staff, when MacArthur was chief of staff, he took Marshall out of one really nice assignment and sent him to train the National Guard in Illinois. But Marshall knew that MacArthur was a leader of men and pulled him out of retirement, but he gave him an incredibly hard time during the war. He was always fighting with the Navy, asking for all the resources. Um, Congress, he had to deal with Congress. They spent a lot of time with Congress. Admiral King wanted all the resources sent to the Navy in Japan. Um, you had big business and labor, each, each trying to exploit the massive expenditures going on. And you had the British, of course. The British were, at the beginning of the war, they were necessary, they were much better at war than we were. They'd been fighting wars for a thousand years. Um, and, uh, but they really, the big, big bone of contention between them was, was D-Day, whether to do it or not, and they went to battle over that. Um, 
So I'm going to be talking a little about the, the characteristics that each man individually had in common. And I'll give you a few anecdotes about a few of them. Um, first class preparation, both Stimson and Marshall. When Marshall, when Stimson was a lawyer, uh, and Time Magazine said in the early 40s he was still the number one lawyer in the country. Um, he was always better prepared than even the lawyer on the other side of the case, a lot of supposing lawyers said. Um, common sense, um, and be simple and concise. When Marshall took over the War College, there had been this tradition of, to give a, each of the students to give a presentation on a battle or a war, and uh, the presentation was anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour. Marshall changed that, and he said, no more than 15 minutes. And after a few weeks, all the students started to complain to him. 15 minutes is not nearly enough time to talk about a specific battle. So Marshall asked someone to look at his watch, and he proceeded to give a lecture uh, on the history of the Civil War in its entirety. And he did it under five minutes. And uh, the students got the point. Um, candid, they were both very candid. They, and it was really touching was reading the diary that, you know, their jobs were so important that they had to get along. And they're humans, right? So they, they, they had their differences. When they did, they knew it was in the interest of the nation. They had to sit there and have tough talks with each other. And you all know from your careers how hard it is to either be, you know, have a boss tell you exactly what he feels about you or having you to tell your subordinate what you feel. But these two, and Stimson recorded in his diary, had to have heart-to-hearts occasionally. They had to resolve their differences um, to, to make it all happen. Um, they delegated uh, and demanded accountability from uh, subordinates. Um, oh, the third one, make do with what one, one has, what one has. Quick story, Marshall sent Patton to uh, the Southwest to train in desert warfare, sent him with one division. Patton came back two years later, two, two weeks later, uh, and somewhat predictability, uh, said, sent a very curse note saying, I need another division, this isn't gonna work without another division. Marshall instead put a guy on one of his aides on a plane to, to the southwest and ordered Patton to get on a plane and relieved him of his duty and sent him to California. And then Marshall wouldn't take his call for a week. <laughs> and uh, Patton was going nuts. Finally sent a friend to basically talk to Marshall to say he thinks he can manage with one division. And uh, Marshall waited another week and then sent him back to California. That's how he, uh, and throughout the war, he just, he didn't take complaints, you, you, you know? You have what you have, you have to make do. Um, they were both decisive. A couple stories. Marshall was in a meeting, an important meeting, and his aide, Beetle Smith, or an aide, Beetle Smith, came up to him and said, hey, I, I need to interrupt you. I, need, I want to introduce you to this guy. And Marshall said, I'm kind of busy here. Uh, what's this about? He said, you know that utility vehicle you're talking about? Um, I have a guy here who has a good idea. He's like, listen, what do you think? Yeah, I think it's a great idea. He goes, go with it. That led to the purchase, an order and purchase and building of 650,000 tanks. Uh, not tanks, Jeeps. Jeeps, that was the Jeep. Um, then I'm reading Stimson's diary. Um, I don't remember the date, early in the war. And he's talking about 20 different problems he was having. Towards the end of his diary, he wrote, oh, another thing, um, I decided today to, to build the Pentagon. Uh, and I think it's going to be a good thing. I mean. <laughs> One sentence about, it's still the biggest building that's ever been built in history. And he had, he just decided, you know, he, that's, these, these guys were decisive. Marshall always felt a, a, a bad decision was better than no decision. Um, they were both uh, protective of mind and body, way ahead of their time. Unlike these uh, Wall Street kings of the universe that claim they, live, you know, work on three hours of sleep. These guys needed sleep, they needed rest, they needed exercise. They were religious about exercise. Every morning, they rode horses. Uh, Washington, you could ride horses back around Washington in those days. Um, Stimson played this sport called deck tennis every night. And they, were, they wouldn't make decisions after 3 p.m. They knew they were making you know, planet-saving decisions. They had to be their sharpest, so they were obsessed about that. Um, they were creative, tough, but cheerful and optimistic. Um, now, Stimson and Marshall together, um, together as a unit, as one, they were both known for their integrity to a fault. Stimson was, his, he used to drive his staff crazy, and, and George Marshall was known, all the British who couldn't, who got in huge arguments with him. Every one of the, their chiefs of staff said after the war that he was the most honest man they'd ever met. Um, teamwork, they obviously had that down 
uh, perfectly. Um, transparency. Duty. A couple stories about duty. I mentioned that uh, Stimson fought World War I as a 50-year-old. The story behind that was, and he wasn't like Teddy Roosevelt, it was just bloodthirsty. Um, he missed the Spanish-American War uh, at the turn of the century. And he was shamed of himself because he thought it was every young man's duty to, to fight in a war if America were fighting in a war. So he immediately joined the New York National Guard. He was a very well-known lawyer at the time of the Spanish-American War, although young. And he trained once a week with the National Guard for the rest of his life, practically. Um, and, and he said, the next time a war comes, uh, uh, I'm going to be prepared for it. Of course, that didn't happen until he was 50 years old. And then he used his, he hit, at that point, he's an ex-Secretary of War. He's a very well-known man in the country. And he used his influence and contacts, which normally is not a good thing, right? You, you don't want to use your contacts to get out of war. You don't want to use your contacts to get a cushy job. But what he wanted was to be on the front lines running an artillery unit. So his contacts are like, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> you know, and they, they gave him what he wanted. He trained really hard. And he served on the front lines for a while in France during World War I as a 50-year-old. Very impressive. And he did it because he felt it was his duty. Um, now, Marshall, on the other hand, two stories about him. After World War, during World War I, his main accomplishment that earned his, him his recognition as a logistics wizard was he moved 400,000 soldiers and 90,000 mules and horses, 30,000 tons of equipment, a bunch of other things, 60 miles from a battle that the U.S. had just finished to the main front line that was going to end the war in less than 10 days. Pershing didn't think he could do it. Um, Marshal Folk uh, uh, of France didn't think he could do it, but he did it. And there was a guy on Pershing's staff named Dwight Morrow, who was number two guy at J.P. Morgan. And during the war, he served as a, a, a civilian under Pershing's staff. He was so impressed with Marshall that he offered him, after World War I, $30,000 a year to work for J.P. Morgan. Now, to give you a sense of how much money that was at the time, Stimson, a rich man and one of the high, high earning lawyers of New York, was only earning $20,000 a year. So what had made Marshall a rich man, he turned it down. He thought he owed the army for all they had given him. He thought he had more to give the army, and he turned down that. Um, the next story about Marshall being duty-bound is um, when Hitler surrendered, not when Hitler surrendered, when Germany surrendered, Marshall wanted to retire. And he went up to Truman and said, can you relieve me and put Eisenhower in charge? He can handle taking care of Japan. I want to retire. I've been at this for too long. My wife's been very patient. We have things we want to do. Um, the things they wanted to do, he and his wife were really into traveling around the Northwest and fishing and hunting and going to various camps and camping. Um, so Truman denied him that, uh, kept him on for a few more months. But when he finally retired, he, um, he and his wife raced to their Leesburg, Virginia home and were really psyched for the rest of their lives. They had sat on the porch taking in the sun and um, his wife decided to go take a nap. And Marshall was just uh, relaxed downstairs and the phone rang when his wife was upstairs sleeping. And it was Truman. And this is the day he retired. He had had a ceremony earlier that morning and this was the afternoon. And Truman said, General, uh, I'd like you to go to China. And, um, and Stimson didn't want, uh, Marshall didn't want to wake up his wife and he said, okay, and hung up. And an hour later, his wife's coming down the stairs, and she's not half, halfway down the stairs. Marshall's on the couch, and the radio's on. It's at the top of the hour. And his wife hears the news, and the news was, uh, and in other news, President Truman announced today that General Marshall will be heading a delegation to China, leaving tomorrow. And his wife, I'm sure, thought to herself, how long have I been asleep? Um, <laughs> Marshall worked for another seven years, and uh, he didn't want any of those assignments, but this is how, how, how dutiful, dutiful he was. Um, they were incredibly loyal to each other. There's a lot of stories in the book how they backed each other up during times. Humility um, is my second to last story before I'll take questions. Um, Marshall's last assignment was he was named to head a delegation to uh, the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II, who died a few months ago. Um, it's 1953 or 1952, I can't remember the year. Um, 
he's an old man at this point, and uh, he is uh, walking down the aisle with General Bradley. And as they're walking down the aisle of Westminster Abbey, one by one on both sides of the aisle, they, they start standing up and clapping. And Marshall turned after a minute or two of this, turned to Bradley and said, whispered to him, who are they standing for? And Bradley looked at him and just like, you know, it's you, you moron, or I'm sure he didn't say that, but that's how genuinely humble George Marshall was. He had no idea. Apparently Churchill at that time broke all protocol by breaking out of his assigned seat and rushing across during that coronation to shake Marshall's hand, the only person he greeted by hand. Um, my last story is, um, and my last comment about their, their characteristics together were, and it's something that I really feel after researching and writing this book, I feel is one of the things that make America truly great is our, our long-standing and strong belief that the military should be subordinate to civilians. Um, and I looked through a bunch of pictures of Stimson and Marshall together. They're not many, but every time I looked at one, Marshall is always respectfully like a step or two behind Stimson. Now this is Marshall's army. He had every reason to be like MacArthur and just strut out of the tent first, but he was incredibly, incredibly respectful of that. And, uh, and it brings me to my last slide and the last story I'll, I'll have. And this is a very touching story I find. This is Stimson's last day in office. It's his birthday, his 78th birthday. Now 78 years old back in 1945 was like the equivalent of 98 today, right? Uh, he was an old man and um, he had a busy day that day because he was trying to convince the cabinet and Truman that the US should share the atomic secrets with the Soviet Union. Now that, that's not an easy argument to make. He had to prepare for it. Um, and his reasoning, by the way, was this. He said to himself, he was, he, he was a very smart guy. He thought, you know, the Soviet Union is gonna have this bomb within two years. They're gonna have it. Why not give it to them now? Then they're not gonna resent us in two years that we've kept it in our pocket as a diplomatic, as a, as a, a negotiating tool. It's just gonna set the relationship off wrong. We're gonna have this horrible Cold War. Uh, so that was his idea. Um, he went to the cabinet meeting and it went, it was delayed, Truman was delayed by something. So meanwhile, while he was gone, Marshall gathered 120 generals at the tarmac where, plane, where Simpson's plane was awaiting to take him home to his home in Long Island. It was the largest gathering of US generals in the history of the army. And it was a hot day and I, with the internet, I checked on the weather that day in, in, in Washington to see it was hot. And Marshall made these generals stand in two lines for an hour and a half waiting for Stimson. And when Stimson arrived, there was an, all Stimson staff was there, there was an army band there, they played Happy Birthday and Old Lang Syne. And Marshall walked through this line of 120 generals standing at attention. And when he got to his plane, which is right behind Marshall in this shot, Marshall took off his hat and bowed, shook his hand, and escorted he and his wife up the plane. And it was incredibly emotional for both men. Marshall went on in the seven years I described after the war, whenever he had an assignment, he always had an oil portrait of, uh, of Stimson behind his desk. Um, and Marshall loved and respected Stimson, but I'd like to think he was really doing this for another reason. He was trying to send a message to his generals saying, listen guys, there's never gonna be another time when the reputation of the US Army and Air Force are higher than they are today. We are kings. But he wanted to send a message to him that he said, he was saying, listen, we report to the civilians and this is the guy who has been our leader over those years and I want you to pay him respect. And I thought it was a remarkable gesture from one of the great patriots uh, of, uh, that America's ever had. Uh, and with that, I'll take questions. Thank you. you. You interviewed two people for the book. Would you tell that story? <laughs> okay. Uh, so I, I, you know, I'm not a historian, and I thought you can't really write a history book without interviewing someone. <laughs> so I desperately trying to find find people, but 80 years had elapsed, and most people were gone. But one of Stimson's staff. The one in the upper left in that photo was uh, 
was um, the son of, of Robert Patterson, Under Secretary of War. He was 87 years old, and he was a federal judge in New York. Um, and in my next life, I want to be a federal judge in New York because his office was the size of this room. It was remarkable. And he's like, oh, where do you want to sit? That area, this area? And he told me some interesting, interesting things. But he said, listen, if you really want to learn about Pat, my father and, and, and his relationship with Stimson, you need to speak to Robert Morgenthau. And I'm thinking to myself, he's still alive? I didn't say that. I thought that would be impolite. Now, Robert Morgenthau, for those of you who don't know, is very famous in New York. He was the, for 40 years or something, he was the district attorney in New York. He was the one who went after all the big crime syndicates and the mafia, etc. He was the son of Henry Morgenthau, the Treasury Secretary under uh, Roosevelt, and also he fought in the Pacific. So it, it, I, I said, you know, you think he'll see me? Uh, and he said, yeah, email him. At this point, he's 97 years old. So I'm kind of delighted. I'm kind of like, well, what am I going to get from this guy? So he was of counsel at Wachtell Lipton, one of the top law firms in New York. And of counsel just means a figurehead. He's obviously not trying cases at 97. Um, so I go to his office. And as I'm walking in, um, and I feel bad. I'm kind of making fun of him because he has since died. But before, I didn't. I, an old man who seemed like he was 100 years old walked by me as I'm about to enter his office like, like this. And, and he didn't see me, and I didn't want to scare him. And he almost walked over my shoes. And I'm thinking, that's the great man. And there he is. And where's he going? And uh, so I walked into the office, and, and sitting there in a desk outside his office is his secretary. He's about 90. And uh, I say to her, I'm here to see Mr. Morgenthau. And she says, oh, he's in his office. And I thought to myself, I don't think so. Because <laughs> I just saw, unless you have another old man walking down the hall. So she says, oh, no, I'm sure he's in his office. So she looks in his office and goes, oh, I don't know where he went. Now, he had to walk by her desk. So that's how quietly he shuffled. She didn't even know he walked by. And uh, so I went to his office. Very impressive. There's a photo of him in Franklin Roosevelt. There was a photo of him and Martin Luther King together, a photo of him and John F. Kennedy together, and 20 other guys. So I sit there for about 20 minutes. The bathroom must have been a little ways down the hall. And then he comes in, doesn't see me. And I'm sitting at his desk, and his desk, his desk chair would be there. And he walks by, still doesn't see me, sits down, still doesn't see me, starts to look at papers in front of his desk. And I just said, I have to do something. So I just kind of went. <coughs> and he looks up for about five seconds and says, son, I want to talk to you about my 401k. And I'm like, oh, you know, just thinking, I wish Patterson hadn't sent me here. This, you know, now I have to deal with this, this. And I said, well, Mr. Morgenthau, I'm not really here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about, it. and then he finished my sentence. He said, oh, you're here about Stimson and Marshall. Fantastic. And for the next hour and a half, he was sharp, telling me all times of wonderful stories. Hardly any that could be used for the book. Um, but it was still fantastic. It was a great experience. The only thing he did tell me, and I, I did use this in my book, was I started asking him about the atomic bomb. And he said, listen, I knew a lot of influential people because of my father. I served in the war. Uh, uh, it was three years before. In the first three years after the war, I never met a single person at any level of society who did not support the dropping of the bomb. He said it was only after two or three years when people started to question, oh, did we really need to do this? And so he, he was very adamant on that point. He said, you know, he said, I haven't read, you know, when you're writing this book, keep that in mind. Put yourself at the time and the place. It was another weapon. We wanted to end the war. We'd lost 400,000 people. The Japanese weren't giving up. They were never going to give up. We had to shock them. And, and so, you know, it's a complicated subject. But that was an interesting thing he said. Thanks for the question. Uh, also, uh, make a comment about his father, Henry Morgenthau, uh, his advocacy of what should happen to Germany at the end of the war. Yeah, so um, a lot of people ask me about the Marshall Plan, because that's the only reason they know <laughs> George Marshall. Um, but uh, I always say, oh, my book ends in 45, can't help you. Um, 
But what I can say is this, that it should be called the Stimson Marshall Plan because uh, in the closing, in the last year of the war, Henry Morgenthau um, came up with the Morgenthau Plan. And, and this, his plan uh, was to turn Germany basically into a farm, uh, strip it of all industry, uh, make the German people live on only sustenance levels, um, shoot without trial, let's say the top 5,000 Nazis, and, and that would be it for Germany. And emotions were running so high that even Roosevelt and Churchill supported this plan at first. Stimson, though, was up, w w went berserk, and he was, he, he really got into a, a, a quite emotional about the subject, and he, he said, listen, speaking to Roosevelt and to anyone who would listen, he said, the German people are an amazing people. Yes, they had bad leaders over the last five years, but they're the most industrious, hardworking people. They are, they have been, and they will continue to be the economic engine of Europe. We want a strong Europe for a number of reasons. We also want a strong Europe as a buffer between us and, and the Soviet Union because <laughs> It's not gonna be a pleasant relationship with that country. Um, he convinced Roosevelt, he convinced Churchill, and two years later when, when Marshall was Secretary of State and uh, they're contemplating the Marshall Plan, he sent, for, uh, he sent an aide to the archives to get Stimson's memos on the subject uh, in 1944. Um, so I, I should think it should be, he should have given a little credit for that. Do you think that uh, the Morgenthau uh, plan? No, the, the Morgenthau, yeah, the, the Morgenthau plan, Henry Morgenthau. Uh, do you think that had to do anything with the uh, revenge on the Holocaust toward the Germans? Oh, for sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. For sure. And Henry Morgenthau was Jewish, but even even those who weren't Jewish, it was that was a part of it. They were some. They did some really horrible things. Germans. So yeah. I can understand wanting to turn them into a farm. Yeah. Okay. Questions from the audience. I. Uh, Chris, you got somebody over there? Yep, we do. Oh, should I go first? Go ahead, Mary. What did, is this on? This is on. What did Harvard and Yale teach at their law school that produced such a high echelon in Stimson's staff? I mean, nothing against lawyers, but it certainly must have been different back then than what they teach at law schools now. What, I'm sure what, there are no lawyers here. We, we don't have to see. We can, you know, or bankers, that. you know. <laughs> but, uh, that's a good question. Uh, but first, yeah. what, looking at that uh, slide that you had, I mean, that's where they all came from. But they were lawyers. It's a great question. Uh, How, yeah. I'll try to answer it um, because Stimson spent a lot of time talking about that in his memoirs. First of all, it was Harvard Law School. Yale was the undergraduate. Um, and Stimson firmly believed in Yale undergraduate and Harvard Law, not the other way around. And probably because that was his experience. Um, Yale was the most influential thing, influential part of his life. But when he got to Harvard, it was just a way of thinking. Um, and challenging convention and being creative, that, that, that's what he learned at Harvard. He was, at first he wasn't very impressed with, with, with Harvard men or Boston or anything about it, but pretty soon he realized, wow, that it was just a, a revolutionary way of thinking that they taught him at law school. Now, not everyone emerged from Harvard Law and, and were brilliant. These guys were the top of their class and they were the cream of the, those, those classes. But it was just a different way of thinking that Harvard case study produced. And again, I, I'll just repeat, it was a, a different way of thinking that, that was, was what Stimson valued in the uh, Harvard Law education. Did either of these two men ever consider entering politics and if they had, how do you feel they would have fared in that area? So Teddy Roosevelt encouraged uh, Stimson to run for governor uh, in 1909 or eight or something like that, or 10, I can't remember the year. And he was a, just a terrible campaigner, <laughs> just terrible. And of course, Roosevelt was one of the greatest campaigners of all time. And he, people used to call Stimson Harry. And after one speech Roosevelt heard, he was like, ugh. He's like, Harry, you know, I can't remember exactly what he said. He said, 
it's an etching, not a description or something, you know, and he was a hopeless campaigner. He lost and he, he never gave it another shot. Uh, I think he would have been good, um, but he, he, he wouldn't have been able to be elected. <laughs> he just didn't appeal to voters. Uh, now Marshall, on the other hand, never thought, uh, Stimson was also, he would, would have been very tough because Stimson was known as the most bipartisan politician of his day. He absolutely, he was a Republican, but starting from early in his career, it was all about the issue. And he left the Republicans at one point over the tariff issue. He thought isolationism was ridiculous, left the Republicans for that and joined uh, 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 Roosevelt's administration. And there's several other cases I give in the book. So he probably wouldn't have been effective there because even politicians then, certainly now, it's not what you, you have to kind of agree with what your party does, even if you don't agree with it sometimes. Um, Marshall never voted in his life. He believed it wasn't the uh, obligation or wasn't, he, he, he just didn't think military people should get involved in politics. Um, no one ever asked him to run. It's a great question. No, one, no, no one's asked him that question. I don't think he ever had any desire to run, you know. Can you give us your thoughts on why the elites were so respected in that period and why they're so disrespected today? Ah. That's a really good question too. I knew I was gonna take, have tough fact checkers and tough questions here. Um, that's a tough question. So first of all, elites weren't respected back then necessarily. Uh, there, were, there was a, a whole group of people that, and you can see it in, in history books, that people have been dumping on the Northeast for years way back when Andrew Jackson was talking about the elites of Boston and of, the, of New York. So it is a long-standing thing to dump on elites. But I think the reason the difference is, is these men were just outstanding patriots. I mean, they all fought in wars. Patterson had a World War I experience that he wrote a book about. It was incredible what he did. He was on a field and he had to hand-to-hand -hand combat these Germans. So they, they were just incredibly respected because they were patriots. Um, now, one of the reasons they could serve in public service, New York lawyers, is because New York lawyers made a lot of money just because that's where all the action was of the European trade and everything. It's not to say that, look, min, that lawyers in, in St. Paul or Minneapolis weren't as bright or as smart, but they couldn't afford because the salaries of lawyers in Minnesota, they couldn't afford to take an assignment in Washington for five years. So it, 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 that doesn't answer your question, but it, it explains why these group of people coming from Harvard and from New York had the money to be able to do it because you could only earn a ton of money being a New York lawyer. Let me uh, piggyback that. I think something that I heard in, the, in your comments, all of them had military experience. Is yeah. that true? Um, Which is something that maybe is lacking in our society today, a feeling of nationalism. Yeah, that, I mean, that's, that, that's a whole, a whole book can be written about that. I mean, it, I think World War II, everyone volunteered in Vietnam, as you know, people tried to <laughs> go to Canada. Uh, so, yes. There's someone down here, if they want to hand them a mic. And I will tell you right now, the, uh, the program that I'm negotiating for next November is by a uh, three-star general from Washington, and his uh, topic is just war, oh. just war theory. That's good. Before you ask the question, and to your question about the elitism, there's one story that Morgenthau gave me that I did use in the book. So there's a second thing, and it speaks to the character of at least one of, uh, of, of uh, Patterson. And Patterson, uh, Morgenthau was the reason Morgenthau knew Patterson so well is he served him as his aide for four years after the war. So they were going into Penn Station to catch a train and, um, and they got there a little late and there was a, a long line and they were standing at the end of it. And this is Robert Patterson who helped win the war. And uh, McCloy, who wasn't as, as, as great a man in my opinion, I mean, he was a great to do, you know, he was a great a go getter during the war. But McCloy comes in after Patterson and just basically cuts the line right to the first place. And Patterson said behind, uh, John, 
I, you must be doing something very important for, to cut this line. And of course, McCloy didn't know Patterson was on the same online and was very embarrassed by it. But the, the, the elites back then were, were more like Patterson and less like McCloy. <laughs> you know, that could be another reason. Yes? Uh, I have a, a two part question. The first is a research question. By a quirk of fate, I lived and worked in um, Lexington, Virginia for a few years and so had some time to stroll around on the VMI campus and discover the Marshall Museum. And uh, I'm wondering, did you do some of the research for your book there? So I have to say that um, if I didn't have a full-time job and was raising a family, I would have done this book proper. And what's proper to do a book like this? You have to spend time in the Marshall Papers. I, I would have to live in Lexington for a while. And basically, you know, looking for that letter that, Stimson, that Marshall sent a cousin saying, you know what, don't tell anyone, but I hate Stimson. I mean, that is what, you know, good research brings up. I couldn't do that. I went there. Uh, I got to hold the um, Marshall Plan speech from 1946 in my hands when I went to the archives. I spent a day doing research there, but it was, I couldn't have done this book without the diary. So um, I love my visit there, but I, I couldn't dig deep into the papers. And the book is, has, is not as good as it could have been, I'm sure. But to be fair, when it comes to Marshall, a guy spent 40 years writing his biography. He interviewed 300 people. He, he went through 3.5 million papers. He went through all the diaries of all the people. He spent his whole life doing it. I, I'm, I'm not going to recreate that, <laughs> that exercise. I used Forrest Pogue, and I felt I wasn't cheating myself too much. And then the, the second question is a reaction to your statement about the different reactions from Stimson and Marshall at Pearl Harbor. Yeah. Because um, I didn't really know much about Marshall, so I read a, lo a little bit more about him, having uh, lived in, in Lexington. And your uh, remark about what Marshall reportedly said to his wife. Yeah. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about his reaction to Pearl Harbor? Because I've done some reading, and I think Marshall was also um, asked to appear before Pearl Harbor report yeah. and so forth, of kind of mm -hmm. like, what was he doing for 10 or 12 hours, either right before the attack or after the attack, or once they knew that there was something happening. I've heard some different points of view about how acute he was at making some choices or decisions in that 24 so, or 48 hours. So this is going to sound a little self-serving, but if you read the book, <laughs> but uh, he was devastated for two reasons. One, because he felt the country was unprepared, and, and that was his main reason. The second reason was he felt a little responsible. Pearl Harbor, it was his responsibility, the Army's responsibility to protect the ships at Pearl Harbor, not the Navy's. Um, very briefly, um, Pearl Harbor was, was at one point near the top of the list uh, of, of places where they think the Japanese could attack, but the Japanese did a wonderful, I mean, they're, they're ma I worked for the Japanese for 11 years. They're amazing planners, and they, they, their campaign at Pearl Harbor was just executed perfectly. Among the things that they did was they fooled all the high command in America to thinking it was their attack was going to be in the Far East, not Pearl Harbor. So it dropped down to about number five or six. Still a possible place. And then the book will describe all kinds of crazy things. The telex machine wasn't working. Uh, he, you know, it, it, the 14 part letter that came, it, only 13 parts came. The 14th was the critical part that said, you know, don't give this to them till one, you know. When they finally got to it, um, they knew that the, Pearl, the Japanese were going to attack on December 7th. They just didn't know where. And then, you know, and there was some fault of the people, both the Navy, the head of the Navy and the head of the Army were at fault, too, for not being on guard. It's a good question. Uh, was there any issue or issues on which uh, Stimson and Marshall had substantial disagreement? So. After 30 talks, I'm really glad you asked that. It's the first time I've been asked that question. And um, the first and, and, and biggest one was um, during World War I, there was this thing called the Plattsburgh camps. If any of you are knowledgeable about World War I, where elite people who could afford doctors, lawyers, bankers, mainly from the Northeast, when Congress wasn't giving any money to train people as World War I's going on, they, at their own expense, they went to all these camps to get trained. And Stimson was one of them. Uh, and a lot of Stimson's guys were, were them. And you had to be able to afford to take off work for a month. Marshall Eddy actually taught at a couple. And during World War I, a lot of the officers, World War I, we didn't 
it wasn't, didn't last very long for America, one year, I guess, or something. Um, but a lot of the officers came from these Plattsburgh camps, kind of well-educated guys from the Ivy League schools who went to these camps. So Stimson, wrongly, thought, hey, this is the way it should be. So when World War II was approaching, he thought that, you know, people from Harvard and Yale <laughs> should be officers. And uh, it worked in World War I, and, and, and he, he poked Marshall about this. And uh, finally, Marshall kind of lost, lost his temper and, and really basically said, if you continue to pursue this, I'm going to resign. And Stimson immediately backed off and realized he'd made a mistake and admitted in his diary um, later on, he said, I, I made a big mistake. Marshall's belief was not just that the, his officers deserved to be there, but he said, oh, only by training in the army do you know what it's like to be hungry. Uh, and you know, because some of the assignments they sent him on were, were very difficult, you know, mapping deserts and, you know, and sleeping outside. He said, you have to know that to be able to be successful. What do you know if you're a lawyer in, in New York about that? So that was the big major disagreement they had, uh, that one. After that, I, I guess the only other one I can think of was Stimson always wanted more soldiers and Marshall always wanted to cap it. Um, the reasons for that that are in the book. Uh, <laughs> but that was a disagreement they had right up to the end. Um, Marshall, Stimson just said, you know, let, let's get more in there. But Marshall had made this pledge, this 90 division pledge, and he ended up being almost perfect. I think there was only one division that ended up not having action during the war. So, great question. Question, another question. When you were talking about the, um, the build-up. One down there too, yes? Uh, the build-up, the tremendous build-up, you know, yes. uh, approaching World War II. Who was doing the arm you know, who was twisting the arms to get all that financed when you were talking about the soldiers, the barracks, the rifle? Um, um, who, was, who was managing to get all that finance? Financing? Um, well, that would have been a lot of people, but certainly Marshall and Stimson were constantly going. They, they, were, doing, they were doing the lion's share of it, okay. going to Congress, sitting there, uh -huh. explaining things, talking, uh, having private meetings at one point. Um, he, he wasn't getting what happened, so a friendly senator got a bunch of guys together at some fancy hotel, and Marshall was speaking to, it's in the book, but I, I don't know, maybe 50 senators, and they were there till like three in the morning, and Marshall just basically saying, listen, let me explain how unprepared we were, we are, and why you need to do something about it, and he was very effective, and, and, and the vote just for the draft um, was so close, so it, the main laboring ore was carried by Marshall and Stimson for this. Uh, and let me add to that. Mary, about... Uh, That's a great question because... About five or six years ago, we had a gentleman come in whose name escapes me now. He is a, was a professor at the University of Rhode Island. He wrote a book about the mobilization. He, he spoke to our group when we were at Fort Snelling. Ehler? E-I-L-E-R? No, oh. no, no, no. I, I, I'll dig it out. I've got it on my phone. Mm. But... Uh, uh, I, this has prompted me, uh, it, it's one of those uh, DVDs that we haven't uh, purified at this point to put on YouTube, but I'll, I'll get with Rob Barris and we'll, uh, we'll get that one uh, done because it, I, th it, I, think, I think it matches yeah, very much I, to support. I actually wrote a lot about that in the book. Um, and um, when I went to the, the publishing houses early, it took me a couple of years, I, I got rejected by the top five publishing houses. and. Uh, among reasons is I'm a nobody and not a, an author, a historian. Um, Marshall and Simpson are esoteric. Uh, and the other thing they said is your, your book's 800 pages and nobody reads books anymore to start with, much less 800 pages one. So they maybe cut 300 pages. A lot of I cut was, was them sitting in front of Congress and, and working congressmen individually as, you know, and they were like a team. They said, you handle these guys, I'll handle these guys. and. Uh, and I had, to, I had to cut something, so I cut a lot of that out, but I, I thought it was fascinating how much time they had to spend. Did you read his book? I did not. Ma Maury Klein, I, I, I grabbed it on my phone, but Maury Klein did a, a, a survey, if you will, yep. that uh, complements very much the implementation of what uh, Ted has talked about tonight. Yeah, I we'll, we'll get that online. I recommend his book after mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, question? 
So having, having read the book, um, one of the things I thought was really interesting was FDR's or Roosevelt's crazy management style, right? Where he would, have, he would give multiple people the same responsibilities just so he could keep control. Um, can you just talk a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, this is a friend of mine, by the way, who's just trying to prove to me that he read the book. I'm still <laughs> college friend of mine. I'm still doubting it. Uh, but uh, so what, Ray, what made Roosevelt great was what also made him very frustrating to Stimson and Marshall. Roosevelt, I mean, no one could have done in the New Deal. Basically, Roosevelt was a man he, he, uh, who always thought you can't, you can't do nothing. You have to do something. And, and Hoover, who was one of the not one of, I consider Herbert Hoover the greatest man to ever become president, the most prepared man. He, was, he had this remarkable life, and yet he, couldn't, he, he, he just couldn't handle the depression. And Roosevelt's like, you just keep on, you keep on throwing things against the wall to see what sticks. And he was the same way during World War II, but Marshall and Stimson weren't like that. So Roosevelt famously would give people overlapping responsibilities. He did it for a couple of reasons. One is there were more ideas that way. And two um, is it kept him in control. Because if a lot of people were given the same assignment, he didn't want any man to be, have a bigger job than him. So when Stimson and Marshall were constantly promoting to have one person in charge of procurement, he always rejected it and said, put these committees, these committees. And again, part of his greatness, but it was Marshall and Stimson said after the war that we could have done it quicker and less expensive with, 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 you know, if we'd done it a, a little less chaotically. Um, so it, it was, you get the good with the bad with Roosevelt, but they both considered him a great man, if not very frustrating to work for. Yeah. Thank you for coming to Minnesota. And for a non-historian, you've done pretty good, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me. Uh, Thank you. We're going to get you up to the book counter here okay. real quick. Uh, and, you know, you need to buy a couple more books for friends. <laughs> Thank you for coming. See you next month. Thank you. Support for this program is provided by viewers like you. Thank you. Additional support provided through the Catherine B. Anderson Fund of the St. Paul Foundation. Upcoming roundtable topics can be found at www.mn.com. Dash www2roundtable.org.